whenever. Yeah, no it's, 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 so nice, it's so nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, it's so, it's so amazing, you know, that you've read my book and to have it studied. So thank you so much, Misha, for, you know, setting it. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I love um, talking about your book. <laughs> <laughs> I know this class is on world building. So I thought I'd just like, I, I'd just speak super briefly about, um, I guess, kind of, uh, a little bit about how I built the water cure, how I came to it, like, I mean, just very, very briefly, and then I will answer any kind of more specific questions you have on it. Um, but yeah, um, I just wanted to say, I guess, a bit about kind of where it came from in terms of, yeah, creating the world, because it is like one that is very close to my heart. Um, it is my first novel, and it's also really inspired by the countryside where I grew up. So I grew up in uh, rural Wales, um, in a place called Pembrokeshire, which is like on the coast. It's a really gorgeous part of the world, um, and quite like a hidden away part of the UK. Um, and in fact, I actually based the water cure on a specific beach, well, like the setting of the water cure on a specific beach, which is called Barrett Fundal Bay. Um, and I think as well, you know, it's creating this kind of space of magic, um, this place, which was kind of, turning almost like my rural upbringing into, into this kind of really expansive magical place where anything could happen was important to me and also I was uh, raised through the medium of Welsh well I was educated in the medium of Welsh um, so even though um, you know obviously the water career isn't written in Welsh but I think speaking that language every day and doing my education through it and it's kind of like a really specific um, musicality to it and I think that is something that also really fed into the novel. And I think also, you know, that idea of a first novel too, it is kind of so much a product of your whole life. I don't know, I feel like I put so much into the book and there's just, you know, there was so much of what I, you know, what I've experienced, also just what I've seen and felt and you don't even really notice until you've kind of finished the book and you, you kind of see it as this product of so much. Um, so yeah, I think those are like kind of, it's just a little introduction, I guess, to the world of the book um, and from my perspective, but I would love to talk about it in more detail based on your own questions and like what is most useful. Yeah. Sorry if I'm croaky, I've got a slight cold. <laughs> That's okay, I think it's, yeah. It's been going around for a lot of us too. Um, yeah, so any, um, I feel like we can just take this, like just unmute yourself when you're, when you have, uh, when you wanna ask a question. Um, or like raise your, do the raise hand function, but I think that we can be more informal and you can just, we can just, um, yeah. Whoever wants to go first can just unmute themselves. Hi, my name's Mason. Thank you so much for, for talking to us today. I was curious, if, uh, so I know you'd mentioned that the, sort of, the sort of world is a little bit based off the countryside, uh, but I was wondering if you could talk more about where you, where exactly you started with the water cure. Did you start more with the story? Did you start with the world, the rules, where? Mason, I thank you for your question. Yes, so with the water cure, it was, it was like a, a process of, of many drafts and many iterations. Um, actually, the original idea, it was, about a family that was trapped in an oil rig. <laughs> I imagine an oil rig in a flooded world. Um, yeah, the rest of it was flooded and it was like their only safe, their only safe place. And I actually kind of like have a lot of fondness for that my, my oil rig novel. <laughs> um, because I was like, it'd be really cool to have a novel on an oil rig. Um, but yeah, I guess my focus was then on kind of just the family and the dynamics between them. And I always knew that there would be like men washing up or other people washing up it was all kind of very um nebulous at that point and um oh yeah I let go of the the oil rig idea partially because of the logistics of I couldn't like research an oil rig I was doing I was spending a lot of time like on YouTube like oil rig tour and but then thinking could they get water like how long does the oil rig like last and I was just I was getting super bogged down in the um logistical <laughs> and so I just thought like what about a hotel a hotel is just a house you know I, they can get water however and it's that which sounds like super unromantic anyway so once I kind of changed it from the oil rig there was almost like the oil rig was kind of getting in my way of um creating the story because suddenly when it was just a house on an island I kind of thought oh like there's a lot else that could be done here and um you know I, I was kind of on the next draft, well, the next draft of writing it by that point, and I started to think more about um, 
you know, what kind of disaster could have put them there? What kind of disaster could have led to the community? So that's when kind of the idea of, you know, what if toxic masculinity, but real came from. Um, so it was like a very, quite a gradual process um, and one with kind of a lot of unpeeling layers almost and discovering what I actually wanted to write about. Um, it was kind of a really good experience for me because it just really reiterated how unpredictable the process of kind of planning and creating a novel is and how often what we actually want to write about isn't kind of what we actually want to write about. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a quite a gradual process. process. Sorry, that's my computer. That's really, I, I don't know about for the rest of you, but for me, like that feels really refreshing to hear like someone else who's processed like, um, it is for me too, like such a process of discovery, but it's like nice to hear like, I don't know, like the oil rig sounds so cool, right? And I, I'm like, I'm, that's such a cool idea, but like part of the process of letting go of ideas, even when they're cool, because sometimes they're getting in the way. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. I always, um, I have this thing called, um, so I can't remember who like taught me it, but um, someone said about the a bay leaf and like, you know, in cooking and you have like a bay leaf, but you have to take the bay leaf out, but like the bay leaf um, gets you to like a certain place in the recipe. <laughs> and, like, sometimes I like you that. Don't to, you don't want to take it out because it's delicious, but like you don't need it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you leave it in, then you try to eat it, then it's like terrible yeah. to have it in the soup exactly. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so the oil ring was like, you know, it was really hard to let go of the cool idea, the oil ring novel. And it was like a cool hook as well. But yeah, it's gone. <laughs> but also but, maybe parts of it are still, I mean, you know what I mean? Like it, like you were saying, it gets you to where you are and like the literal oil ring is gone. But um, yeah, but the yeah. flavor of it, like the bay leaf is there. <laughs> The, the, the important bits of the stories are still there, which is good. But yeah, if anyone else wants to write a Norwegian novel, like go for it. <laughs> I'm sure someone else wants <laughs> to do a better job than I did. I have sort of a similar question. I or you talked a little bit about like going on YouTube and looking for videos of oil rigs to try and inform the oil rig novel. And I'm curious about what other types of like research that you did for this book, like. Did you, and specifically with the, uh, like the, with the cures themselves, like the, did those have roots in any specific cultural practices or, yeah, like what types of research did you do? So I, I read a bit on kind of um, ISIS communities and cults and stuff. I've always been kind of interested in that stuff. But yeah, the water cures, um, it was, that was an interesting one for me because I kind of based based it like super loosely on things like Victorian hydrotherapy um but I tried not to read too much around it because I didn't want to kind of copy them and a lot of the cures are really specific um and I kind of wanted to find my own cures but I think that like you know the concept um of you know water can cure everything and these often quite sadistic treatments and these you know entire spa towns it was it was kind of um recently I actually went to a spa town in the Czech Republic and I was like this would have been so good for <laughs> research for the water cure and it was just it was kind of so strange because it had all this amazing architecture and all these hot springs and you buy like a little cup from a stall and you literally go around and you get your water from the hot springs in the town and you drink it and I was like this is so weird and and in the museum of kind of water cures they had these you know, all these strange bathtubs and stuff um so that, that felt like almost like a, a research that was too late but yeah I was reading a lot about um yeah I think it was the I think the reasons why they treated people for these things as well not just for like health but for things like being a, being, a, being a hysterical woman, being someone who, you know, needed some kind of form of release and how that, you know, tied into things like, um, I guess, like the history of the invention of the vibrator and things, all, all, all these things which were kind of aimed at this sort of purity and purging, but also this emotional release that really resonated with me when kind of yeah, creating the cures in the water cure. I have a question about your writing process. I was wondering if you could speak to like how the novel evolved over different drafts um, and what your process was through like killing your darlings, changing the story and ultimately refining it to get the final product. Yeah, so I am like, a, I'm a really messy <laughs> drafter. Um, I always feel like really almost like embarrassing because I don't know if it's, I hope, I hope maybe it's like, 
useful to know because or, or I don't know if it's also like kind of in a way kind of disheartening because I went, I went back to like the early draft of the water cure I remember when I'd finished it and I was like wow I really kept about like 5,000 words of the original in here I'd kind of like changed it so much um but I mean the, my first drafts are like shockingly bad <laughs> <laughs> very bad I think I just need to have something and then I always think like if I have something I can work with it like I just feel very intimidated by a blank page basically and if I have like you know if I can get to a certain level of word count I it's almost like I'm kind of just tricking myself in a way um but I like that process of editing and redrafting now now that I know that is my process and that I will change everything and everything is provisional in a strange way it takes a lot of the pressure off for me because I think you know it doesn't matter if this bit is kind of terrible or it's not working it's just here for now and you know we can make it work after so yeah the water cure I mean I changed just about everything obviously changed the setting it was all narrated by one uh, by one person at first it was only it was only narrated by Leah and then I changed it to kind of multi-voice narration I changed the entire tense and I did that like or, yeah the entire tense and I did that kind of pretty pretty late on because it was narrated in um it was narrated in like Leah first person the whole way through but it was like in past tense and then I decided to make it present tense and yeah at the time I remember thinking oh I really don't want to do this because like I don't want to change an entire novel <laughs> <laughs> and then I started kind of writing some bits out like just to see and I was like no okay it makes it like so much better <laughs> so having to yeah do, changing all those things was scary I don't think I would have fared very well basically in a world where you had to do it on a typewriter and to fix things out because I just really like the freedom of being able to copy and paste and you know change these massive things like not necessarily on a whim but just to have the freedom of thinking how is it you know how is it going to work best how can I figure out how it works best like I need to just try these things so yeah it was a messy laborious process but I feel like the novel is like hard one for that now. I always feel like it's great to hear I don't know I'm a messy drafter too so I like I always like uh, to hear that and I agree I kind of like sometimes try to put myself in the mind frame of what it would have been like to write a novel without before having a computer and it really is difficult to imagine like because mm. the committing to something like you're saying like changing the tense if you weren't using a computer I mean it would just be such a massive undertaking and obviously people did it but yeah there is an author in the UK um do you guys know Sarah Moss um she um yeah she she says part of her process is she writes a whole first draft and then she just like literally deletes it and just writes it again. <laughs> and I was like, hey, I'm not going to go that far. <laughs> but I can kind of, you know, I can kind of see where she's coming from. She's also like incredibly prolific. So yeah, I don't know how fast she, write, how fast she writes her first draft. But yeah, right, I think that right. if, I, if I was writing in the typewriter era, I would have been just like terrified to even press a key, I think. And I think, you know, actually having, not having that terror and not having that idea of a kind of, sunk cost fallacy but I mean having it like in a different way but um I think it's it really frees us up quite a lot <laughs> I had a question about the perspective and how you shift to multiple perspectives I was just wondering how you tackled that especially with like the sisters being so similar and how the writing process worked and changing perspectives um yeah yeah so because they are quite similar it was a challenge and yeah Leah I mean Leah was like the original only voice so it kind of made sense to me that she would be the main voice um and Grace was added in kind of quite late because I just wanted to give a different perspective on what had been happening because she has a really different perspective to the sisters I just kind of needed to add this extra dimension I, I felt that was what it needed and I wanted to see the end through I guess these different lenses and to have some things explained so yeah Grace was actually like quite a late addition um but the the chorus voices where the sisters all speak in tandem that was a decision I made because I just I wanted to have Sky speak as well but actually I did she doesn't have her own bits because she is kind of so much younger than the others that when I tried to um create it like a bits where she was talking it just didn't 
like ring true for me it kind of felt too young and was almost like bringing the narrative voice down somehow I just it, it was kind of like just quite a challenge to kind of make her fit with the others so I thought if I could just put her in with the with all the sisters and they could have this collective voice which is almost otherworldly and naive and also kind of you know calls up things like you know sirens and mythology and this idea of like a, a chorus which is almost outside of the world um that felt like a neat solution for me basically so yeah again it was kind of like an evolution but yeah that's really interesting to hear because we talked kind of a bit in class about and we had sort of decided that maybe sky was too was like why she didn't have her own parts just because she was like too young so that's, mm. it, that's interesting to hear yeah I feel like it's really hard to write a childlike voice in a way that is like very convincing and uh, you know some writers do very well but I don't know if it turns out so. yeah I had a question just a little bit more about what the uh, publishing process looked like for you especially since you're saying it's your first novel yeah sure well I write I wrote a book before the water cure that was um kind of my my novel in a drawer so that was my first um experience of publishing basically because I got my agent through that novel but it wasn't published it didn't get picked up by a publisher um so my lovely agent Harriet was like oh just write another book and I was like okay <laughs> um so I wrote The Water Cure then um it took me about two years and but I think I was just kind of so you know, I was kind of so angry by the process of having written a book and then it didn't get published. And I was like, I know this book is good, but I know I can write something even better. And, you know, I'd had this idea rattling around for a while. And so I was working full time. So I was working on it in kind of the mornings and weekends, and evenings and stuff. Um, and yeah, I just kind of, I don't know, the story just had such a hold on me that I kind of got super obsessive by it by the end. But then, my, my, again, my agent was so amazing through the whole process and, you know, kind of really held my hand and was there for me when I was like, I don't think I could do it. She's like, you can, you've done it before, like, just come on. And when it was ready, then she sent it out to publishers and, um, you know, I was kind of fully expecting a repeat of, like, the heartbreak <laughs> from, like, two years before. Um, but this time, uh, there wasn't a heartbreak. It was good. We had several offers. And so it went to auction in the UK. And, yeah, we got the deal that way. So it was kind of, it was a long process. But I think it was ultimately, ultimately worth it. I want to really quick circle back to the that sunk cost fallacy that you mentioned, uh, and I, you talked a little bit about this with the oil rig. But how do you know when you're when you're drafting and drafting when to work on something and try to change it versus okay, this just isn't working, cut it completely. Yeah, that is a good question. I I think I'm still kind of figuring that out sometimes. If if you know if you really love something in the novel and but you you know you, you can spend so much time just trying to make it work because you really want it to work and I think you know I'll have things like that even right up into the final editorial process with my editor where I'm like I really want to keep this <laughs> I really need this and she's like but you know it's kind of not serving the story um and it, it or it's you know it's not good enough but it's, it's hard when you're attached to it I think um I try and just have a degree of objectivity I think but yeah it is hard to know and especially if you have spent time on it um rather than like it being like a kind of a darling you have to kill as well I think it's it's really hard um but yeah I think the the word processor thing helps here as well well yeah because even when you take it out you can always comfort you know, I rarely ever go back and find and you reuse things but I tell myself I could and that feels better right like I yeah, have a I folder have, of things and I always have like a big document that I call cut bits for like I call it a cut bit for water cure or something and then it's like this the document cut bits it's like the the mirror novel and it's usually like three times as long and it just doesn't make any sense because it's all cut and paste bits and I'm like I will definitely use these it's like no I won't <laughs> Probably not, but it's still nice to have them. Yeah, sure. And actually, like, I remember actually with my um, the novel I'm working on now, I, I cut, my editor was like, you need to cut this bit. And I really didn't want to cut it. But I was in, like, kind of, I was so frustrated. I was like, fine, I'll just cut it. And then she kind of came back to me and was like, actually, I think we should put it back in. And I was like, ha. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, you have to keep a hold of those bits or, like, trust your gut, I think. Yeah. 
kind of along those same lines, what's the best editor's note or like readers know anything that you've gotten about like a piece of work that you've written? Oh, wow. Um, I think, I think like any, like you mean like in, in terms of like editorial advice or just like something really nice that someone has said or? Either way, which has been like the most helpful? It's helpful. I think I always really like bowled over with the water cure at the kind of people who have um, just, I, th I think just like people telling me that it's resonated with them or that, you know, it's kind of really spoken to them and, and meant something to them. Like, I just kind of, I think that's what you always hope for when you write a book, you know, that you will have a, a reader, even like one reader who just, you know, if it, they feel like the book is for them. <laughs> and so to have people kind of feel that way about something I've made is like really incredible. And yeah, I kind of think about that if I'm ever feeling kind of down on writing about how, you know, how that amazing that is and how sometimes that still happens now. And, you know, just... It, it just it just feels really great and um yeah it kind of makes it worthwhile um i was curious about kind of the other question uh like if you enjoy having people besides your editor read your drafts before they're done and kind of what advice you found most helpful from someone else yeah, so I often um, shared my, I, I kind of am not a big share of drafts, but only because I just, I don't have, um, I guess I don't have so many, uh, I do have a lot of writing friends, but it's kind of like, not, we're not so much kind of workshop friends, we're more kind of social friends. Um, I One person I always really trust is my agent, but also I, I really trust my former fiance, who actually is a programmer <laughs> and like he never reads. <laughs> <laughs> except but um he reads kind of a lot of non-fiction and so I kind of I really always like giving him my manuscripts because he will give me kind of feedback which is so like um you know so kind of different and he has quite a different take on it so I find that like weirdly useful um but usually I show it to my um agent before kind of anyone else because she is also like kind of a really close friend but I am actually trying to kind of actively get more feedback because I sometimes feel like quite lonely <laughs> in the writing world I kind of I, I tend to swap like maybe stories and stuff with some writer friends um yeah but I think yeah having that kind of different perspective um has been really useful even if sometimes I'm like can you not focus on the fact that I misused the comma and can you think about like the plot <laughs> yeah yeah it's nice that you're agent I feel like there's so many different varieties of, of agents and before I like entered into that part of the writing world I had no idea but that there are agents who read what mine is sort of I, I'm guessing similar to yours like will give a lot of really really great feedback and then I, I think I just felt very lucky in that because I decided to work with the first agent who I ever like talked to and then later I learned that there are many agents who actually have no interest in giving any like feedback which I would be very sad if that <laughs> if that were the case for me but I guess there's a whole variety and it's, we got the good ones. <laughs> like um, my um, my friend, she got like a massive big deal, like huge, and I was kind of a little bit like, oh, like kind of, you know, I was like, oh, it's a, she had like a, a big deal agent, you know, and the yeah. agent was like, yeah. the novel and was very much like, you've got twenty four hours, get in your preempts, get in your offers, and it's off the table. And I was like, wow, it's like so showbiz. Um, but then because like that, my my agent doesn't operate like that at all. My agent actually, she was an agent's assistant. And she took me on, like, I was actually her first ever client. So she had, like, time to work with me really closely. And, like, yeah, like, we are really close friends now. She's one of my closest friends because we, we were working together for, like, 10 years. <laughs> um, and, like, yeah, so I think at the times I had a little bit of insecurity, like, oh, I don't have the big deal agent. You know, she's never made a book deal. Um, like, no one really knows who she is. Like, did I make the right choice? But I, like, completely made the right choice. Um, and my friend who has the big deal agent, she was kind of talking to me recently. And she was like, oh, I kind of really envy that you have this, like, beautiful relationship with your agent. And you like, quite collaborative. And you can run things past her. And, um, you know, because, like, her agent is a bit like, okay, chop, chop, send me the new book when you're ready. And she's like, are you not going to, like, give me feedback? <laughs> right, like, it needs to be, like, done and ready to, like, show to the world. Yeah. He's like, no, no, just, like, send me the book and then, you know, I just, whatever. 
So. Um, go get people with money. <laughs> I mean, I'm really sure every, both approaches have their pros and cons, but. <laughs> I'm I have a curious. question about, oh, go ahead, Tyler. You're good. Oh, no, 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 you can go for it. All right. Um, I had a question about sort of the jump from writing short stories to full-length novels, and I don't know how long ago that was for you, but I was just sort of wondering what were some skills that you had to develop that were maybe unexpected or unique challenges that sort of came along with, with transitioning to, to writing longer, longer pieces. So I started write. well, I used to write poetry because obviously it's super short. And then I went to a university and I did like a creative writing minor with my English degree. And one of the options was that you could, instead of doing like a, uh, you could choose between an academic dissertation or you could do a creative dissertation. Um, and so throughout my degree, I'd kind of been writing short stories, but I mean, I just couldn't, they, they were more like flash fiction. I couldn't really figure out how to sustain a longer narrative. They were maybe like a thousand words. And because I was coming from a poetry background anyway, it was a bit like, oh, I don't really need a plot. Like, I just need like one beautiful image, whatever. Um, and I did kind of get by on that for a while. But when it came to this longer piece, um, it had to be 10,000 words. And I just really preferred to write a 10,000 word creative piece than, a than an academic dissertation, even though I hadn't done <laughs> a 10,000 word creative piece. Um, so that was kind of my crash course in learning how to create a plot, which turns out is necessary, annoyingly. Um, but it was really useful in terms of making me think like, you know, actually it was a kind of laziness and the fact that I would, I would kind of be like, oh, I have an idea, a nice idea. Here we go, here's the idea. Just presenting the idea and not thinking, well, actually where can this idea go what does this idea mean um I'm just kind of writing short stories after uni and I was also writing like my first novel the one that didn't get published at the time and I've always preferred writing novels ever since the, that experience in uni where I discovered like oh actually writing a long piece is super satisfying I think I like that satisfaction of sitting with something quite a long time and I find short stories, um, you know, they just, I find they occupy like a really different space in my brain. Mm -hmm. And I, I like having that space occupied. I think it's like a refreshing change from the long thing, but it still feels, um, yeah, I, I still find them like quite difficult. I actually haven't written a short story in ages and I'm like, have I lost the ability? Because <laughs> so I've been writing novels too long, but I don't think it actually does go away. I think, you know, there's like with a short story, you have to, realize it's like a novel in miniature I guess you have to realize like the whole thing and you can have so much in it um yeah it's, it's almost like kind of less forgiving than a novel but mm -hmm. I still I really love them and I've been reading a lot of short stories recently to try and prod me to remember I have a question about um, some of your personal experiences writing this novel. Like, what were some of the easiest and hardest scenes to write? Like, I know when I'm writing, sometimes, like, there are some scenes I'm so excited about where I can't write as fast as, like, my brain is coming up with things for the scene. And other times I'm, like, just trudging through the mud, trying to link two important scenes together, and, like, the words will not come. So I was wondering, like, what scenes from The Water Cure were some of the hardest and easiest for you to write? That is a great question. Um, I think some of the hardest ones were almost like the more everyday ones, the ones kind of thinking about their life. And, you know, it's like the kind of the 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 problem of, like, I remember when I first started writing stories, it was like, how much do I keep in? How much do I take out? Like, I wake up and I get up and I go to the bathroom and I brush my teeth. Like, how, how much kind of the how much of the everydayness do we need? And when they are kind of living like the same day over and over, like how, how to keep that interesting and how, how to also like logistically like link things up and to think about the spatial space of the house and, you know, the, the, the breakfast room and the beach and stuff. And 
um, you know, how their, how their life actually fits together. So it was, yeah, it was kind of like everyday things that were difficult, weirdly. Um, I think the, my, the easiest scene for me to write was uh, Sarah's death, because I just felt like by that point I was on this like kind of red, red um, rush of almost like finishing the book and feeling like, ah, he's going to die. <laughs> and I was going to like, I was thinking a lot about like, um, what the, 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 uh, the painting was like Judith, Judith taking off the head of Holofernes kind of thing. I was like, I don't know, I just like, I just really relished writing that scene because it just felt so kind of bloodthirsty and over the top almost, even though, I mean, it was kind of restrained in the final draft, but um, yeah, it just felt like um, a, a good ending, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Satisfying. <laughs> When we were talking about that part of the book in class, I was I had meant to, and then I we got into our conversation and I forgot, but I was gonna pull up that painting. That's funny. I mean, it makes sense that you kind of had that in mind at some point, but yeah. I have yeah. a quick question on um, linking. You were mentioning having things linked together in your world. How do you keep, or what is your method of keeping track of all the maybe seeds that you plant early in the novel and making sure they're fulfilled by the end? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, <laughs> they take a lot of trial and error. Um, I think like with, with writing, I kind of like taking sometimes a quite an analytical approach to the things like the scene structure, because I can find it really hard to, um, I can find it hard to kind of just keep track of everything and um, yeah, remember where everything is. I don't know if any of you guys like use Scrivener or any kind of program like that, but I use just a really chaotic system of pages documents. <laughs> and so, yeah, making sure that all the loose ends are tied up and everything made sense was difficult. Um, I kind of actually wrote like a spreadsheet and I, I would kind of put summaries of all the scenes and even some of the notes, like what is this scene achieving? Or like, you know, <laughs> things to kind of help me always see the novel at one glance like the to see the shape of it and the structure of it and see like what needed tying up and what, what needed like more work and stuff so that helped me Um, hi, I wanted to ask a quick question about like we were talking about scenes and it made me think about writing choices in general. Um, and so I guess I wanted to ask like, what do like the big choices look like for you? Like when you're writing a book, do, do you know at the very like, did you know at the very beginning that mother was going to die and that these men were going to like have this plot twist where King is still alive and you know, yada, yada. Or, like, are those things that you just kind of stumbled on as you started writing the book? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I stumbled on them. I think they were, you know, there were things that I, I knew I wanted to have, like, you know, the sisters. And I actually, I, I knew the ending from the start. I think I, I knew that whatever happened, like whether it was oil rig or whether it was hotel, that I knew they were going to be safe um, and they were going to be fine and there was going to be hope. So that was kind of like my major choice, I guess. But yeah, all the other things were things that I kind of stumbled upon as I went through things that I thought might kind of yeah serve the narrative or things that kind of felt right as a decision um, or even like little kind of occasionally light bulb moments. I was like, yes, <laughs> I'm glad this, glad this came to me. I'd love to hop back to the publishing process for a second. I'm wondering, like, what did the timeline look like from, like, you starting writing this, you writing different drafts, you getting in contact with an agent, like, the first copy being birthed <laughs> into the world and people's bookshelves? Yeah, I think with the water cure, it actually, it actually to me, I mean, it, I guess it's kind of objectively long, but it kind of felt pretty fast. I think I started writing it in... 2005 yeah about 2015 um maybe like a little before and then we sold it in 2017 in the spring um and then it was quite a fast editorial process like I worked on it through that summer and we had like a finished manuscript by the autumn we had proofs out by the autumn and then it was released in spring 2018 so it was about like from kind of first draft to publication it was like three years which actually that does seem <laughs> that does seem kind of fast 
especially because like with my novel that I'm working on now like it's not gonna be published till 2023 and it's like I sold it like earlier this year <laughs> just but, well, I guess that's kind of like yeah which seems like a really long time but I think um yeah it just kind of all came together because I published in the UK with quite a small like imprint of Penguin so they have a small team and they have a small list and they just had like a, a slot and just kind of worked out that way but it's so variable especially with covid that's why my book i guess isn't my next book isn't coming out for so long because everything's kind of been shuffled um, but my agent i was yeah working with her for uh, i think I, yeah, I was working for her with with her for about five years before we sold daughter care so we we talked a lot about about like feedback and everything and what you changed and what you cut out was there anything that uh someone told you hey i don't know about this that you were like no i really like this we're keeping it yeah i think the, i think there must have been um maybe more kind of like tones of phrase or language and stuff um i'm trying to think like what specifically <laughs> i feel like such a long time since i wrote it i feel like mm -hmm. um since the pandemic, my my brain has just kind of is like a sieve <laughs> for that thing. I'm like, wow, and especially like now the book is like published and kind of out there and belongs almost like to everyone else. It's so it's strange to think like, oh, there was a time when I had like choices <laughs> and things that I <laughs> really miss. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I think maybe it was more like um, language things, and I think also um, my editor made me compress the time scale which actually totally makes sense because compress it into like a you know like a a week um does make a lot more like sense in, in terms of the narrative and stuff i think in my original kind of thought it was just a whole kind of like long lazy summer but i don't think i was particularly attached to that but i do remember with my actually with my second novel blue ticket there was a whole part of the ending that like I, I really like like I shed some tears <laughs> with my editor <laughs> about having to cut it out um because she felt it was like a, almost like kind of really surreal birth dream sequence like set in a ho hotel and a hotel of like pregnant women and my editor was like oh it's kind of like really beautiful but it makes like zero sense and like need to lo lose it and I was like oh but it's like beautiful and psychedelic and you know like anything can happen it's speculative and she was like no like people are going to read this and be very confused like I'm very confused it was beautiful and I was like okay um so I was really sad to lose, <laughs> lose that. I think that's like the main the main thing that I've been sad about during writing is yeah having to lose something that was yeah sometimes having to make that compromise between something which is you know feels really dear to you but just pure doesn't make sense I had a question that kind of relates to what you said about like the book going out and belongs belonging to everyone uh and I'm curious about like how you think about this book's like position in like fiction and in like the genre or like body of work that is sort of similar to this like when I, I was googling the book I saw a lot of comparisons with The Handmaid's Tale and I was curious about like if you had thought about connections to that book or if you thought that it existed more as separate or how those comparisons would you feel? Yeah, that's a great question. I think like my feelings on it have kind of evolved. So at the time I was like, yeah, like, yeah, obviously it is definitely like feminist dystopia. Um, I kind of didn't write it like that, but it felt like that made sense in terms of classifying it because, you know, it's kind of like a bit science fiction-y and, you know, it did have a feminist element. So I was like, I'm fine with that. Um, but I feel, I feel like maybe it's still, you know, it's still definitely place it within that, but it's almost like the weird little sister, <laughs> the, the spooky cousin. Um, it feels, I think, more like literary to me, whatever literary means, you know, but just in terms of, um, I don't know, because I felt when I was writing it, I felt a kind of, I was trying, not trying to be experimental, but I wasn't writing specifically to kind of a traditional narrative. And we had the kind of playing around with voices and stuff. And because the focus was not on the actual world and the disaster that had happened, it was more about the kind of 
the family element and the relationships between the sisters and their relationships with themselves. And it kind of felt it had more in common with things like, um, you know, Shirley Jackson, we have always lived in the castle and those kind of spooky, gothic, almost like haunted house narratives. So yeah, I think it definitely has like its own little odd space <laughs> in, in that kind of genre, but I wouldn't kind of necessarily, um, yeah, it fits uncomfortably. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the how you didn't uh, address the world and the disaster that had happened. Um, we definitely talked a lot about that in our class, and I was wondering how much of the world was formed in your head, and do you did you imagine very specific events that occurred before uh, the scenes that take place in the book? Yeah, so this is actually something that. Um, I kind of spent a bit of time on because the book is like so vague as you as you will know <laughs> um there is so much that kind of isn't said um or spoken about and so something I kind of realized is that I needed to I needed to know myself and so I did actually write like a backstory um that obviously didn't make it into the book but kind of to get things straight in my in my mind even just things like who is king like how do they have a hotel <laughs> um what has happened on the mainland um well, you know at least kind of an idea of that and you know like what's the deal with him and mother so, so there is this kind of solidity behind it that was just useful for me to know and so kind of coming from a place of deciding how much to tell and how much to share so kind of yeah spending a bit of time on that was important for me I think with something so ambiguous it's good to have um a bit of a base even if it's just for yourself yeah we talked about that a lot in class like the like how I firmly believe that you can feel in a text when the author knows more than is there on the page. There is like this kind of underpinning that I think you can feel. And I likewise, I think this is not the case with your book, but with other things I've read, you can feel sometimes when someone, when, when the writer doesn't know anything outside of the bounds of what's shown, right? And I don't know, because there, there could be benefits to both, but we, we talked about feeling like, um, you must have, yeah, gone through a process of deciding what to share with us, but that you probably knew a lot more than we did. Yeah, I think I just, I, 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 I like the idea of, like, no. <laughs> I, I think, you know, there was, there was definitely a time earlier, early, earlier drafts where I was a bit like, oh, I don't really need to, like, sort this out. But then it would kind of come back to bite me <laughs> because I'd be like, oh, this is, like, definitely, like, a loose thread. Um, or this is something I don't know enough about. I need to actually... Um, I need to get it really straight in my in my head so I can kind of figure out um, what is going on. So, yeah, because especially it is a speculative world and it is a world that I have made up. I mean, it, I need to kind of almost imagine like if I was being grilled on it that I could. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 um so yeah just like yeah trying to make the world as real to me as possible but I think in that in terms of you know how much you tell the reader and how much of that ambiguity you're willing to concede it's such a it's such a fine line to cross isn't it because it, 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 it's it's really kind of trial and error and sometimes I wonder you know because the water cure is my first book um if I you know I could have maybe let on a bit more but yeah I don't know We'll probably take like two more questions. Um, or if everybody feels like, like you know, you've, you've already gotten to voice your questions, that's fine too. But um, I'll give us a, like just a little space in case there's anyone who hasn't got to ask the question yet or another question or anything that came up as we were talking. One thing that I actually am still curious about. So we talked a lot about the, the writing and the publishing processes and everything. What is your... What is what is the part of the process that you look forward to the most, and what part do you dread the most? <laughs> oh, um, so I kind of 
both of them are like editing actually I think the different kinds of editing and I'm actually I'm going through one right now and I've just been through one I think well, actually I really, I really like the first draft process I really like the kind of I guess like it's the honeymoon phase I'm like yay I'm writing a new book this is fun and then you know it kind of I mean that bit doesn't last so long <laughs> it's like oh no <laughs> I've reached 20,000 words and I don't know what to do um there was a time well, there was a point with the book that I'm working on now where like I, I got like fully halfway through and then I was like it's just not working <laughs> it's not working and that I, I don't like that bit at all um, I also am not a massive fan of my kind of first first round of edits with my editor. Like when it's kind of, it's the big structural stuff and I basically just have to try and fix all the things that I've been ignoring. <laughs> and we've had, again, this like this beautiful honeymoon stage of like, oh, we just bought your book. Hooray. I love your book. Here's yeah, some thoughts on your book. And then I'm like, oh no, these things are actually... <laughs> really difficult you know what I'm talking about these things are like really difficult to fix um but the other bit that I like which I am on now when I've made it past that horrible editing bit is the bit where it's kind of it's more like line edits with my editor and they kind of just um I don't know it just feels like more easy to digest and you can really see the shape of the book and what it's becoming and so it kind of just feels more motivating and satisfying than having to be like oh I've got to fix this massive plot hole it's like I've got to make this sentence good <laughs> Um, I had a question regarding, like, you kept referencing, um, like, oh, it's speculative, so I can have, like, free reign. Um, just, like, looking into, like, MFAs and things like that, I've been just, like, dreading the kind of, like, stigma around speculative fiction versus, like, literary. So I was kind of wondering if, like, that divide is present in the, like, literary world or if you're conscious of it at all, like when you're writing, um, yeah. That's a really good question. Um, I don't know like how, I don't know if it's like different in the US or the UK, but I feel like in the UK, there's not really like a divide at all. And I think, you know, there's so many authors doing like really cool stuff, cross genre. And I think there's like not as much, I guess, that, that kind of separation between literary and genre that used to be. And I think, you know, there's some really great authors which are kind of dividing those gaps all the time. And there shouldn't be a stigma anyway, because it's like, you know, a, kind of, a lot, a, a lot, a lot of my, a lot of my kind of thinking around speculative fiction has really changed, and the kind of my approach to it, and like what it means, and what we can do with it, and actually, um, you know, as a as a kind of mode of thinking, as a first for genre, it's, it's it's like one of the most kind of amazing things we can do for ourselves as writers, because it's basically just like imagining, <laughs> um, and and so I think it's just, yeah borrowing these elements um or like whether we borrow them or kind of like plunge headfirst into them um it's all like it's all good and I think yeah I don't think you should be worried about that I, I, I don't worry about it anyway sorry would you mind explaining what speculative fiction is and like the words you were just using sure so like speculative fiction I guess would kind of loosely be um they call it like the what if fiction so we're thinking kind of science fiction with a kind of social element I guess like um like the Handmaid's Tale or 1984 things thinking kind of reflecting social um social problems maybe that we have um and like creating a kind of future solution for them or not even solution but just kind of yeah playing the take forward I guess that, that is like kind of my 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 nutshell definition but I feel like it is it is kind of broader than that but it is I guess kind of broadly a kind of science fiction yeah I always think of it as like science fiction that's like like you said like that's in, like much more interested in social questions and like people and and our reactions than in technology or something like that you know like that not that there isn't that can't be a part of it but like the focus is on humans and like yeah emotions and like you know why 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 we do these things and why the world is how it is like how can we make the world better but also how could the world be worse and yeah, yeah. <laughs> what ifs a, bit, well, a lot of what ifs in terms of like social yeah stuff yeah cool does anybody have any last uh it doesn't even have to be question thoughts comments 
I'm really curious. One thing we talked about was like the world building that we don't get to see in the novel. So I was wondering, and I'm prepared for the answer to be no, but if there's anything you're willing to share with us about like who King is or what's happening on the mainland or like bits of world building that didn't end up being explicitly stated in the novel. Oh, so King was kind of, I kind of imagined him as like, um, kind of like a bit of a, like a, a kind of a criminal, like a kind of a criminal overlord um, kind of thing. Um, so he had this like, <laughs> so he had these like kind of connections um, and was able to, you know, kind of manipulate people. And that's why Clow and um, James had like, you know, they were kind of in his debt in a way. Um, and, you know, mother was kind of connected in that world as well. And there was, there is like, on the mainland, there is a, there is a, a disease, but it's not as bad as like people are saying. Um, so there is like an element of the truth, but it's been like run away with. So, yeah, <laughs> two, two nuggets. <laughs> That's great. I have one last question for you that, uh, because I think, so the, how, what is, how do we pronounce the character that with, comes with J of James's brother, right? That's so. So it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a Welsh name, it's Llewellyn. Okay. Um, yeah, it's hard to say, you have to do like, I can't, I can't even describe like, it's, it's double, yeah, double L, but it's like, you kind of put your tongue behind your teeth and you go, yeah. Okay, <laughs> it, okay. It, you know, well, like, I don't know if I can pronounce it, but it's nice <laughs> to hear it. Like, yeah, because we talked in class and we were like, well, we can't, we have no idea. So we just called him Lou, but we knew that wasn't right. So yeah. Lou is also fine. It's like, I would not expect anyone who is not like, raised with the Welsh language to say it. Like even my dad who's lived in Wales for like 40 years can't even do it. So. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, we're, we're so thrilled that you came to talk with us. We're, yeah, thank you so much. It was all mine. Thank you so much. It was so nice to speak to you all. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for like having me and hope you all have a great weekend.